Amen. So today, as I said, we're, we're finishing up this series. The first Sunday that we talked about this, three weeks ago, I talked about the word discipleship. I kind of laid the framework for you, the groundwork that back in November last year, God had given me two words as I asked God, what is it that we as South Point Church need to do in order to grow, in order to go to kind of the next level and the next step? And I explained that I'm not comfortable and happy with us just being a, a church of 200 people or 300 people or 500 people or 900 people because there's always somebody else out there that needs an opportunity to have an encounter with Jesus. They don't need an encounter with me or with South Point. They need an encounter with Jesus. So God, how do we keep pursuing that so that we can keep extending that encounter to people so that they can have the encounter with Jesus? God spoke two words to me. And that was discipleship. And that was direction. And those two things we've really been working on. In discipleship, if you've been around, we've been talking about who's your level one disciple. So for, for those of you that don't know, discipleship, big scary word, I've made it super easy. You don't have to be super spiritual, super Christian. You don't have to be any of that. But you pick one person, set a reminder in your phone, send one person, one WhatsApp message every week at the same time. And that's just a message of encouragement. Now, that's not where discipleship ends. But if we're going to go out and, and share and, and disciple the world, we need to learn how to do it with each other first. And so part of that is me taking away. Why does that feel so hard? Why does that feel so threatening? Now, let's just dive into this thing here. And so discipleship, we, we talked about that. Who's your level one disciple? That means that, that entry-level point, here I am, I'm just messaging this person. And I know that God brings fruit from that. I've seen fruit in every person that I've done that with, and I continue to do that with people. And I know that other people are starting to tell stories about how they've seen fruit coming in from that, and God opened doors with friends and family, neighbors, co-workers, you know, all of those people. And then the next week, last week, I talked about vision. I talked about direction. And how that was something that, that we needed to know where we were going. So we know who we are. We know why we're here. We know what we are. But we didn't really know where we were going. And so I invited you to pray into that. To say, God, where is it that South Point Church is going? And now today, we bring those two together. And combining those two together is going to give us an opportunity to kind of solidify this moment in South Point Church history, in South Point Church, um, and, and this is our time, our season as a church to make a declaration so that five years from now, six years from now, two years from now, we look back and we say it was in this moment, in this series, at this time, that we made a shift and we decided to do it this way that led us to where we're going and led us to where, where we're headed. And so... That's why I'm so excited about this. And, and as I thought about this, I thought, okay, we've been talking about who's your plus one. Like, you know, the idea is you're inviting somebody like on a party invitation. Uh, you get invited. You say, hey, I've got a plus one. You bring somebody along with you. But as I started to think more about today, it's, okay, we're talking about discipleship. And you have to do something to disciple people. We're talking about direction and vision. You have to go somewhere in order for that to be, uh, for you to be moving towards direction, purpose, vision, those types of things. But how do you know if you're doing it right? So, so the question is, 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 is how, do you, how do you actually know your when? And, and as I started to think more about that, like, okay, how do we know we're doing it right? I like to know if I'm winning or if I'm losing. Am I doing something right? Am I doing something wrong? So what is my win? How do I know when I'm winning? And so how do we know when we're winning? Well, I, I then began to unpack that a little bit. Because if we're talking about discipleship and we're talking about vision, we're talking about all these things that go outward into the world, right? Right? And so then my question was, well, how do I know if we as a church or even just I am winning my world or winning in my world? So I want you, this is, this is the part where it's personal application to you. How do you win your world? So that's a question you're going to answer today. How do you win your world? So let me define that for you. So first, we have to define what is your world? All right, so we're not, in a, we're not in a spiritual bubble right now. This is real life practical stuff. What consists of your world? It's the people you talk to. It's the people that you sit with um, at, at lunch at work. It's the people that, 
that bump up next to you, maybe you're on the train and you see these people or you're on a bus and these, that, that ecosystem of human beings that's around you is your world. It's the people that interact with you. It's your friends, it's your family. Your world consists of all the areas, all the groups, all the places that you go. If you go to V to E every morning for coffee before work, the person that works behind that counter is part of your world. So your world is everything that you bump up against, everything you, you are a part of, that you interact with, and then it interacts with you. That's how you define your world. So we all have a very unique world because we don't all go to the same places. We're not all related to the same people, unless you're Tracy, and then we're all somehow related to Tracy. <laughs> I'm looking for her. I just can't see her. Okay, she's hiding. Yeah. Yeah, no, we're, we're all... We all have different worlds, but when you think about it, if you start to really unpack that, your world is quite big because you encounter a lot of different people. You, you, you walk by the same people, you go to the same places. Your world is bigger than you think. It's bigger than you realize. So how do you win that world? Okay, the, first you define it. Now, the second thing that we do with this is we establish the type of relationship that you have with your world. So what that means is, do you feel like you're winning? Do you feel like you're losing? Does it feel like life is just an endless cycle of oopsie daisies and, and losses and I messed up, I did that wrong? Do you feel like, uh, man, you're just killing it right now? You're getting promotions at work or you're killing it with the girls or whatever it is. Like, you're like man, I'm winning it in, in my world right now. What kind of relationship do you have with your world? Are you a bystander? Are you somebody that is just cool with letting the world go by and you're not really impacted by it. It doesn't really get impacted by you. See, see I think that, that when we find ourselves thinking about, okay, how do you normally feel about who you are? When you start to unpack this, this thought of like, okay, I kind of feel like I'm doing okay here. And then I kind of feel like I'm not doing okay here in this area. So maybe in this part of my life, I feel like I'm really winning but in this part, I feel like I'm really not winning, I'm losing. And wouldn't it be really cool if I just kind of felt like I was winning everywhere? See, now hopefully you start to take the mental journey that I'm hoping that you take of, of how do you win your world? See, wouldn't it be cool if we were winning our world? Meaning that all those people around us that we impact and that they impact us, that we're winning in that situation. That it feels like we're doing well. It feels like life is good. It feels like we're full of happiness or joy. Or even on the sad times and the hard days, it still feels like I know my purpose. I know where I'm going. I know what I'm doing. I have good relationships in my life. I mean, that, that's ultimately how we want to feel. We don't like feeling uh, empty. We don't like feeling alone. We don't like feeling depressed. We don't like feeling like we're entering into a a situation of culture or people or, or environment where we've now got to look different, feel different, be different, put on like a bravado, where we've got to say, okay, no, okay, when I walk through these doors, I'm, I'm, everything's good. All the, I'm just going to put the face on. You guys know the face. Hey, how you doing? I'm great, man. Everything's doing really good. And on the inside, you're just, you know, you're dying on the inside. You, you don't want them to know that. So you're not winning your world when you're that way. So what kind of relationship do you have with your world? And the third one, and this to me is kind of where I really connected with this right here, is that we have to understand the character that we play in our world. So who are you in your world? Are you the hero? Are you uh, the, the person that comes in and saves the day? Are you a hero at work, but a villain at home? Or are you a hero at home and a villain at work? Or maybe you're a hero in both places. Maybe you're the comedic relief. Maybe you're just uh, the, the person that's a, I mean, does anyone ever feel like they're just a background, like an extra in their own life? Like life is happening to you. You don't get to dictate any part of it. And no matter what you do, it's kind of insignificant. You're just an extra. You just... You just sit in the back. 
You're playing an, a role of an extra in your own life while everyone else is playing the starting role and playing uh, the, the heroes, the villains, the romance, the comedic relief. All those things are getting played by everybody else. And you in your life, you're the extra. See, what character do you play in your world? See, I hope that you start to see this idea of, okay, I have this world that I'm in. And this world... I'm in it. And I have a relationship with this world. And it impacts me and I impact it. And I have a character. I have an identity within it. And that's how I see myself in this place. That's how this world sees me. And if you take all that together, then I think that there's these moments at the end of the night when you lay down and before you go to bed and you just want to feel like you're winning. You just want to feel like you're able to win that world that you're in. You want to feel like you're not at least losing. See, it, it, as I was planning this series, today's message to me kind of almost felt like, like a game, like choosing themes and choosing characters and, and this idea of winning at life and winning your world. And so like, if I think about life as a game, then we're actually all playing the game of life. And even if it's just you on a team or you and a whole bunch of other people on a team, it's still, at the end of the day, it's you versus the world. See, th this is a, a very hard game for you to win. This, this game of life is difficult. This, this game where, where we go out and we just try and exist, we try and get life to... I guess this is hard stuff. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes I feel like there are a lot of moments where it's just me versus the world. Now, in all reality, it's not. I've got uh, you guys, many, many of you on a personal level. I've got a wonderful wife. I've got a wonderful family. We have great friends. It's not me versus the world. But a lot of times I feel like it's me versus the world. So what I want you to think about in your life now is where are you winning? Where are you losing? Where, is, where does life feel like it's clicking together? Where does it feel like it's not? Where do you feel like you're playing the character you want to play? Where do you feel like you're not playing the character that you want to play? And then I just want you to understand that no matter how hard, no matter how hard you try or how hard you work, it's always going to be you versus the world. And it's always going to be one of the hardest games for you to win. Unless, and there is hope to this. There's actually a lot of hope to this. So I want to explain to you why you should want to win your world. And then I've got two questions that are going to tell you how to do it. So I always like to ask the question is if I'm sitting in your seat, why does this matter to me? So I've been talking about winning your world, but like I said, you may be super comfortable in your position in your world. Why do you, why should you want to win it? Why, why should you uh, feel like you need to kind of shake the apple tree and knock all the stuff off of it or knock the dust off the mat? Like, everything's fine, just leave it alone. I've learned to cope. Well, a lot of the reason is, is that you should want to win your world because a lot of us have developed coping mechanisms where we're okay with existing in horrible situations. We're okay with accepting less for our life. We're okay with accepting uh, le less for our future. How how many people do we know that have just given up on life? They've given up on their future. They've given up on a hope or a dream that they had. And, and life happened over and over and over and over again. And life kept happening. And before you knew it, that dream, that hope was gone. Out the window. Completely given up on. See, it's important before any of the rest of this makes sense or any of the rest of this means anything to you. It's important for you to know why you should want to win your world. You know, I, I would just ask, it, are you happy where you are? If you don't do anything today and you leave this room, are you really truly happy with everywhere that you are? If nothing changes, is every aspect of your world, that's everything you bump up against and you come around against, is every aspect of that good? Are you happy with it all? Now, if you're the rare person that says, I'm completely happy with everything, well, good for you. 
There's, there's one of you, and you're probably a liar anyway, <laughs> right? Because nobody's happy with everything. Yeah, that, let, let's be real. Let's be honest here, guys. See, it's, it's, le- it's not that likely that, you're, that there's anyone that exists that says, I'm completely happy with everything. It's much more likely that there's a bunch of you sitting in this room right now that says, I don't want to open that box or take that step. I don't want to deal with that wound. I don't want to address that person. I don't want to look at the areas of my life where now I'm going to feel disappointed because I, I let go of that dream and I let this thing come into my life and it stole this other passion that I had. And, and so I'm just going to sit through this message. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to have a cup of coffee. I'm going to go hang out with my family and friends. I'm going to watch Netflix tonight and I'm going to go to bed and wake up tomorrow. It's Monday and I'm going to do it all over again. And you know what? You keep doing it. 52 weeks out of the year, you're going to do it over and over and over and over again. And guess what? All that stuff that you don't want to open up and you don't want to deal with, it's going to still be there. It's nuclear waste. It doesn't, it doesn't break down or, or degrade. It's not dissolvable. It's always going to be in your heart. It's always going to be in your life. You're going to carry it week after week after week after week. So what I'm imploring you to do this morning is to say, what if I was just brave enough a little bit to consider what I could do to win my world? What would that change in my life? It probably would change a lot. It probably would change more than you know. So here's your two questions. The question one is, who is next? See how we did that? When? Who is next? I'd love to say that I'm smart enough to think of that, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. It was a very good friend of mine who's also a pastor. And I messaged him the other day and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take something from you. And he said, go for it, you know, brother. But who, who is next here? See, if we want to win our world, then... We can win our world by determining who is next. And and what that means is, is who, so who in your life is next? Who are you pouring into? Who in your life are you reaching out to as the next person? Who who in your life are you developing? Who in your life is, is developing you? See, see, by thinking about who's next, you're getting out of, I'm stuck here. And if we put it in the context of, of this series that we've been in, who is next is very, very closely related to discipleship. In fact, it, right here, the win is knowing if you are next to disciple or next to be discipled. So here's what this is going to require of you. If, if you decide, you know what, I, I'm, I'm not going to do this another 52 weeks out of the year. I'm going to try. I'm going to go out. I'm going to win my world. So I'm going to think about who is next, okay? Who's next for me? Now, you may be a person that says, I need to step out of this position that I'm in, in this area of my life where I'm not winning, and I need to step forward, and I need to say that I am the next person to be discipled. You know what that means? You're saying, I want to be the next person for somebody else to convince me and talk to me and tell me how great and loved I am. Oh, that's so horrible. Why is that so scary to us? It's terrifying. It's scary because you have to first take a step and say, my life's not together. My life's a little bit of a mess. But I'm going to say that I'm next to be discipled. I'm next to be loved. I'm next to be taught about Jesus' love. I'm, I'm next. Somebody, please help me. Now, the only thing that's going to keep you from taking that step is every thought that you have in your mind right now that's saying, nope, don't do that. Go to lunch. Don't do that. Have coffee. Don't do that. It's too cold outside. Don't have, you know, don't think about that. That, that is the, that right there is, is the devil. And the devil would love for you to never grow or improve, but would love for you to stay exactly the way that you are. Let another 52 weeks roll around in the calendar and you've not dealt with a single thing that solved any part of your life that you're not winning your world in. And then there's others of you that you need to stop being so selfish with yourself and with your time, and you need to say, who is the next person I'm going to disciple? Meaning, who's the next person that I'm going to love on? Who's the next person I'm going to pour uh, love into? Who's the next person I'm going to encourage? 
And you know what those of you are thinking right now? You're thinking, I'm busy. I have a lot going on. I'm not in a good season in my life. There's a lot happening around my house. You know, the kids are kind of crazy right now. Everything's a bit up and down. You know, we're all busy. The economy's bad for everybody. But if you stay there, then you're just going to stay there. There's going to be a part of your world that you're not winning. See, if you're in a place where you're ready to disciple somebody else, but you don't do it, you're holding on to something so selfishly that God has given you, which is an understanding of His love and His care and His abundance. And all you have to do is look at that person that's not where you are and just share that with them. You can change a life that way. That's part of the, the level one discipleship. Is send one WhatsApp message to one person every week at the same time and watch someone's life be changed. See, I'm daring you guys to do it. And you can't come back to me and say, well, it didn't work for me. It didn't work for my person. Well, okay, well, how many times did you do it? Did you do it every week? You know, and so, well, I did it twice and six months in between. So, well, okay, twice a year is not going to do anything. But if, if you think, who, who's the next person for me to love on? And maybe I'm the next person that I need to be loved on. See, today at the end of this message, you're going to get an opportunity to come forward and, and, and meet with one of our prayer partners, and you're going to be able to say, I'm next to disciple somebody, to love on somebody, to message somebody. I have the availability to, to do a video call with somebody once a week or have a coffee, or I'm just putting my name in the hat to say, when somebody needs some help, I'm here to help them. Or you're going to be able to come down, and you're going to be able to say, hey, you know what? I, I need to be discipled. I need to be loved on. I need to be cared for. I need to be taken care of. I, I need some help winning my world. So I want to be next for somebody. I want to be somebody else's next. And the only thing that's going to keep you in your seat is fear, fear, and fear. I thought, well, let me think of another word here. There's not one. It's fear. You're afraid of giving up your time. You're also afraid of sticking out. You're afraid that everyone else is going to see you as, as broken or as a failure or weird. You're just afraid. Men, maybe there's some pride there. I'm not a guy that reaches out for help. I'm not a guy that does this or doesn't do that. You know what? That's something in this room you can just completely drop. Because in this room, it's okay. I'm, I'm the lead mess up. So who's next for you? The second question for knowing uh, whether you're winning is, is the win is, is this. The win is knowing what is next. And this is the piece that, that leans more into the discipleship or the vision part. So again, I want to win more of my world. So I'm recognizing there's parts of my world that, that aren't happy, aren't good. There's parts of my world where I don't feel great in. There's parts of my life where I feel like I'm not winning Okay, why should I want to win my world? Why should I even listen to this stuff? Well, because how's your life going so far? And I dare you that if you really picked and dug into your world, you'd say, you know, actually there's some things that aren't great, that aren't working. Well, I've got this beautiful, pain-free, uh, easy thing that can help you. It's called Jesus, yes. We don't have to be afraid of the name of Jesus. And if you're new here, if you don't know anything about Jesus then I'm here to tell you that he's the coolest guy, the nicest guy, and the most loving guy that you'll ever know, that you could ever know, because otherwise I wouldn't be up here. Like I said, I'm a total wreck. So what is next? See, for, for me, this is, this is really like special for me because I feel like this is the area where we as a church are, are just right on the edge of just becoming that next thing that God has for us, but that has to happen inside of each of us individually. And the reason what is next comes after who is next is because we have to first know how to love and care for each other, disciple each other, tell each other about Jesus, talk to each other when we have a hard day, encourage each other, reach out to each other. We also need to have the ability to see somebody that we know walk down our hallway and just know that, you know what, they're not doing all that great today. Let me just buy them a coffee. Let me say, hey, can we meet sometime this week? I want to like raise our awareness for each other. 
so that we know each other. And I said, one of the greatest feelings that I had on my birthday, which was last week, was I told Casey, I felt known. And that was something I'd never felt before. I felt known. And I, I want all of us to feel known to each other. And we have to do that. We have to learn how to do that before we can really start to know where we're going and what is next for us. But last week I painted a little bit of a picture of this, and I want to reemphasize that for us this week. But, but direction is very closely related to vision. And the definition that I have for vision is this vision is a picture of the future that produces a, a passion in the present. So vision is a, is a picture that you have of your future that produces in you this great, wonderful passion that you have now in the present. And then if you apply a spiritual definition to that, a bit of a spiritual slant, then spiritual vision is it's a picture that God has painted for you in your future that he has created for you. See, we, we, we love the idea of, of, of having big vision and big direction and know where we're going. It's easy to say those things, but... But we often find ourselves looking for like, we're looking for purpose, we're looking for meaning in life, but really, we just need some vision. We just need some passion. See, when I think about what is next for me, what's next for Chris Ladd, what's next for our family, I think, okay, Lord, show me the vision, show me the picture of my future that can make me feel passionate today. And I'm not looking for meaning and purpose in my life. I have no desire to find any meaning or any purpose in my life whatsoever. No desire. Doesn't matter to me. Partly because I know that it's already sorted. My purpose is to love God. And the meaning of my life is that I am loved by God. Could those two are done. That's easy. See, for me, it's, it's vision. What gives me passion today? And that's when God gives me vision for this church like he did last November where he showed me these two words and everyone walking out of the auditorium and they're just being something new that is happening here. And the benefit of a new thing happening here is not that we bit, we're big and we grow and magical things happen here. It's that in every single person walking out that door, they were covered with a newness that God was putting on you. A, a letting go, a breaking off, a shedding of all of those things that have made you feel like you just can't win your world. And, and even I still experience that. Last Sunday, you guys just threw a, a great uh, birthday celebration for me. I just really want to thank you so much for doing that. And I woke up on Monday morning, which is actually my birthday, but we didn't tell Benjamin that, our four-year-old. As far as he knew, Sunday was my birthday. And so on Monday morning, it was like we just pretended that it wasn't my birthday at all because then his little world would have shattered and been... You know, like, well, but what did we do yesterday? Well, why don't we do that again today? And nobody could handle that, you know. It would be like exposing the, the matrix to a four-year-old. And so, so but I was, I, I woke up, and I woke up with like, with the strangest feeling. And I, I, I got up, and I went to the kitchen, I was making coffee, and then I, I, I left. I don't know if I had to take someone to school, a child to school or something, and I was coming back home, and I almost didn't tell Casey about this because I thought, ah, if I don't, I don't want to tell her because then if I tell her and it's wrong, then what does that make me? See, that's how fear works. See, what God was saying to me was, hey, Chris, you're next. And then God was also saying, Chris, here is what is next for you. But I was afraid. I was afraid, well, if I, you know, tell Casey about this, that and then, and then it doesn't come true or it doesn't happen. Yeah, I'm just going to look silly or look dumb. Also, I was afraid that, hey, maybe I don't want to let go of this thing. Maybe I actually just want to keep it because it's comfortable. And I like it in my life. And if I tell her about it, that means I've got to accept what God and declare what God has spoken to me. And so I almost didn't tell her. But I felt so new. I felt so different. And I didn't do anything to receive it. But I woke up on my birthday and I felt like something had just broken off of me. It just felt like a, like a, a bondage, like a weight lifted, gone. And I wasn't carrying around a, a deep, dark sin. Uh, I wasn't dealing with, um, you know, some kind of crazy depression or something. I was just, life has been pretty good. But I woke up and I felt light. I felt free. And I told Casey, I said, I don't know what it is. 
I don't know what's happened, but I do want you to know that there's a part of me that was in bondage that's now been set free. You know what I did? All I had to do was wake up and have coffee and then just tell somebody about it. You see, before we, we find meaning and purpose and that's what we think that we want, really what it is is we need vision in our life. We need direction in our life. See, God puts that in our life like he did for me on Monday morning. Chris, I'm going to give you a picture of the future. It's a picture of how you feel free and now how everyone else can also feel free. And that can make me passionate about today. But for a split second, I thought to myself, what if I don't want to claim that? Now, I believe that God still would have swung around on lap two and tried again and again and again until he got me. But man, I really would have missed out on something. See, what makes you passionate? A lot of us can't answer that question because we don't actually know. We don't know what makes us feel passion because we've stopped asking. We've stopped looking. What's a picture that you could see in your future that could make you feel passionate today? See, that's a bold prayer that I dare you to pray. I dare you to, to ask God that. God, give me a picture in my future that can make me feel passionate today. And then I, I, I would even encourage you to pray a prayer that doesn't make any sense to you. See, ask for something that you can't come up with a way to receive it. Because then only God can give it to you. You know, I ask for God to open a door that only He could open. That you can't find a way to open it yourself because then you know that only God opened that door. You know, I ask God to put a dream in your heart that doesn't make any sense to man. It doesn't make any sense to us. Because the second it makes sense to you... It's doable and it's possible by our, own, by our own reasoning and understanding. And I just think it'd be a whole lot better if the only way that you could point to it is to say, well, God did it, not me. So I want to show you how, before we get an opportunity to respond to some of these things, I want to show you how Jesus won his world. Now, if you've you know, been in church, you know that Jesus wins. If you flip to the you know, everyone says if you look in the back of the book of Revelations, you know who wins the war. You know, Jesus wins. The, the devil doesn't win. But how, how did Jesus win his, win his world? He did it this way. Same as us. Jesus had his win. Who is next? And what Jesus would do is he would go out and he would make disciples. And Jesus would make disciples and then he would teach them how to make disciples. And if you weren't here for week one and you hear me saying the word disciple, I don't know if, if it feels like, um, that, I don't know, maybe our electricians can answer this for me. When I lived in Nelspruit, in my shower, if I was taking a shower and I reached up to adjust the nozzle of the, the shower head, and then I also adjusted the temperature at the same time, I would get electrocuted. It wouldn't be big, but it'd be a little bit. It'd just be like a, like a good twitch. And I tell the, the person that owned the house, is on this farm, and he says, oh, there's probably like a loose earth wire somewhere. And I'm like, what is this? I mean, is this, should I be concerned? Is this dangerous? He says, no, it's fine, you know. But every now and again, I would just get hit with this, like, this sort of like surge of electricity. <laughs> And this wasn't like for a weekend. This is, I lived there for two, over two years. And, and, and I feel like when I say the word disciple, that for some of us in the room, that's what's happening. You're just like, ah, you're just hitting that twitch, that, that electricity is hitting you. And it's not horrible, but it's not the best thing ever. But I just want you to know that this, this word, a disciple is somebody who's learning. And you're learning from somebody who's gone before you that knows more and they can teach you about it. And when Jesus is making a disciple, that means that Jesus is teaching you how to walk in his ways. And, and Jesus' way led with love. So as Jesus is making disciples, he's teaching people how to love like him. And then he's teaching those people how to teach others how to love like him. So when you hear me say, who wants to come up and be discipled? Who wants to come up and disciple somebody? Really what I'm saying is who wants to come up and learn from Jesus about love? And who wants to come up and teach somebody else how much Jesus loves them? It's that easy. And that's what Jesus is doing all throughout his ministry. He's making disciples that make disciples. 
He's creating a movement of love that's producing another movement of love. And Jesus, he has his who's next, but then Jesus also has his what is next. You see, for him, the what is next is, is easy. What, what is, what's the goal for everybody on earth? Why did he come to earth? Well, it's for eternity. The what that's next for all of us was when we accepted Jesus into our hearts because he died on the cross for us, we get eternal life in heaven. See, Jesus had a who is next and he had a what is next. He had a, a, a discipleship process and he had a direction and a vision process. See, the picture that God painted for Jesus was one of all of mankind restored with God. And that made Jesus passionate about telling everybody on earth about his heavenly father. And I'll show you that Jesus had this, this kind of a secret weapon. And it's in Matthew 22 here. And it's, that secret weapon is it's, it's love. And, it's, and Jesus replied to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Now the reason I'm sharing this with you is, if you're concerned about anything that I'm saying about discipleship, or, or if, if you get an opportunity to come up at the end of the service, and you're feeling nervous about it, or you're feeling like, ah, you know, I don't know, is, is that okay? Is it safe? You know, we're really big on safety here. I'm sharing this verse with you because I want you to know that this all comes down to and falls back on one thing and one thing only. It's not judgment. It's, it's love. Love, love, and love. And so Jesus is asked by the Pharisees, what's the greatest commandment? Because there's over 600 or so commandments that the Pharisees had assigned to the 10. So it started as 10, it grew to 600. And they say, Jesus, which one's the greatest? Because they're thinking, well, if he picks one, then that means he's got to devalue another. And Jesus kind of, you know, outsmarts them. He outloves them. And he says, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Then he goes on to say in the next verse in 39, and he says, Jordan's going to put that up for us there. He says, the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is, unselfishly seek the best or higher good for others. That's a hard thing to do. The whole law and the writings of the prophets will depend on these two commandments. So Jesus is saying, love me with all that you have, and then go out and love your neighbor. And oh, by the way, your neighbor, see, this is, man, I'm so smart. This is where we go full circle here. What he says about your neighbor is yourself, the good of others. Jesus in, in Leviticus defines what a neighbor is. And he says, it's anybody around you. It's your world. So Jesus is saying, go win your world. He's saying that, love God, love me. But then go out and win your world. Go love your neighbor. And by the way, your world is everybody. Because you come in contact with everybody. So go win your world and do it with love. And so now that brings me to one of our last points, and that says, how, how is South Point Church, how are we going to win our worlds? So we've talked about what is your world. We've talked about why you should want to win your world. We've talked about um, the two ways that you can win your world. We've talked about how Jesus won his world. And now we look at, okay, how does South Point Church, how are we going to win our world? How are we going to do it? How are we going to win our worlds collectively? And how are we going to do it as a church? It's so simple. It's not any magic here. And here's the thing is that we know what our win is. I know what our win is. I talked about it last week. And I spoke it over our church last week. I'm going to speak it over, it, over us again. But this is our win. And in this win, it encompasses who is next. And it encompasses what is next. Who's the next person? And what's the next vision and direction? And so th this is it here. It's in uh, Zechariah is the, is the verse. And it's chapter 8, 3 through 6. And so many people came up to me after the service. And said, man, that, that is, is for us. That resonated with my heart and soul. And I'm thinking, well, good. Because God has spoken it over our church here. And it says, thus says the Lord. I shall return to Zion and dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city of truth. Now, we are not claiming Jerusalem's seat in God's eyes. Jerusalem is Jerusalem. That's a holy city that David built. God's got a, a connection there. But what I 
hear from God is God saying, hey, South Point Church, you're in a city. It's Cape Town. I love and I sent my son to die for everybody that lives in that city. And so Cape Town is a place that I want to dwell in the midst of. And I want to play a part in Cape Town being known as a faithful city of truth for God. And then I love this part. And the mountain of the Lord of hosts will be called the holy mountain. Guess who has a mountain here? We do. We're a huge one. It's called Table Mountain. And so here, God is saying, I want to be there. And I want to be a part of this. And even the mountain next to you will be called the holy mountain. And then it goes on in the next verse, in verse 4 and And it says, thus says the Lord of hosts, old men and old women will again sit in the streets, public places of Jerusalem, and each man with his staff in his hand because of his advanced age. And the streets of the city will be filled with boys and girls playing in the streets. What a beautiful vision for our city. See, I know what our win is. This is our win here. See, it's our win because I see who is next here. Who is next are the people that are out there. It's the children that are growing up in the community. Who is next? It's the elderly that are now free and able to sit and roam around. What is next? What is next is a city that's built on on love and truth and that's known by God as a holy city. It's a city that, that God has set aside and he's put his presence in. It's a city that's filled with safety. It's a city that has walls broken down and barriers broken down. See, I can say, okay, this is our win is that we become a kingdom-building church and that we go out and we impact and we have an effect on the city. And then God even says here in in the next verse, he says in verse 6, he says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If it is difficult in the eyes of the remnant of this people in those days, then will it also be difficult in my sight? Let me just make that easy for you to understand and digest. And and, and that says God is saying, You may think it's hard, but it's not going to be hard for me. You see, that again goes to that area of fear. So when I ask you the 